Um. Yeah, so that is... I don't think we want to work on it yet, but I'm going to just jam it in here of like foop dot rs. That's not what I wanted. Oh, I think I can actually paste. Oh, oh, the red comments. Let's go, baby. Oh, fuck. Yeah. Oh, oh. Oh! Oh, fuck yeah! A color scheme I used to use like five or six years ago had this. Oh! Oh, they're so strong! Okay. Yeah, so um, this is the project I've been working on for a hot minute here. And I don't need to build it or anything. But basically, it's, it, it leverages um, invariant lifetimes and, and a bunch of weird shit and a really fast atomic Q, uh, FIFO Q implementation <laughs> to allow parallel, in this, parallel initialization of structures. So you can like basically create structures that have uninitialized fields and then you can schedule those fields out to be initialized by threads. And then threads can initialize those when they get the tasks to initialize those fields. And then the entire structure in the fully initialized state becomes visible to you in a future event. So it like gets handed back to you. So I really, really like this model. This reminds me a lot of like... C development doing like KQ, EPOL, select style work where you basically like have your bucket of FDs that can fire. In this case, it's like your bucket of events and you have a loop that handles the different types of events that can come through. And it's just one of the best ways that you can do parallel processing because the, the cost of these context switches is so unbelievably fucking low, right? So, it's, it's really cool. But I have some expressibility issues that I'm working on right now, which is mainly around how do I prevent mutably borrowing a field, sending it off, and then not letting the compiler prevent borrowing it again. <laughs> It, it's it's kind of, it, it's brutal, but whatever. We, we'll eventually go over this code, probably at some other point, because this isn't what we care about. I will say this Atomic Q implementation is like the best fucking thing on the planet. Like, you can have the the context switch cost of these threads is like, like on the order of like 50 to like 100 cycles. So you can have tasks that take like 300 cycles to complete. Like very, very simple tasks. And you can split that work off. So you can end up parallelizing things to a degree that you normally couldn't. Because like normally when you're doing like OS level threads, if you're not doing like a millisecond of work, even that, even a millisecond is like probably not enough work. You want to do like five to 10 millis of work to justify the OS level context switch and all the cache and validation ramifications that come along with that. This puts that context switching in control of you. This is how I would do async, right? I don't like fucking async. Um, I don't like async because you lose a lot of control you end up kind of putting everything into this like mysterious bubble of processing. I want to see where the things are being scheduled and where they're being used. And that's really important because it allows you to eliminate some of the abstractions that you typically would need because you can start scoping things off. You can have, you can reuse a queue that you push some events onto pop a couple events on, and then use different events after that 
and you can contextually understand that you don't need to handle the previous events, there's, there's so many optimizations you can do with that. And the faster your scheduling and like task management is, the lower that overhead is, the more parallel you can make things. You can start splitting up parsing eight kilobyte files instead of only splitting up one meg files because you can't justify spinning up a task for that, right? Have you tried writing an async executor? I did when async very, like when the async sugar went into nightly. So ultimately, I don't even know if that is what it is like anymore. It was really just they added pin and the, and the future sugar. Maybe they haven't changed it. I don't know. But yeah, I, I wrote like a, um, uh, I think single threaded. I don't think I made it multi threaded because I didn't have a good FIFO queue. But async executor stream, I just have no need for one. I'm never going to use async. It's just, async is just always worse for performance and code uh, simplicity, which is we, we, like, you can write way simpler, way less code to do async stuff, but it's more complex in terms of what are the actual ramifications. Like, where is the state being held? Who owns it? What is included in the state? What are context switches? All that sort of shit. I just, I hate async. I don't like it. I don't like it. You're, you're, you're putting a bunch of shit in a black box, and you don't really know where it's going and when it's going to be used. I, I don't like it. I don't like it. To me, it's like undefined behavior, basically. It's like you, you call a wait, and it's like, yeah, I don't really know what's going to happen. I can't really develop code in this environment because like, I don't know how expensive this is going to be. I don't know the memory costs. I don't like it. Generators and coroutines? I'm not familiar at all with generators and coroutines, so I can't speak to that. Kind of sounds like you don't understand async. I mean, none of that is defined. <laughs> like, that's... That's the thing, is like, you don't even have a, an executor in Rust. So like, the information I need to know is like Tokyo specific internals, which is just not, I don't want to learn the internals of some ever changing third party library. I just don't fucking care. Like, CFS scheduler in early versions of the kernel had default 6 milli time slices. Later it was changed to 750. 750 seems a little fast. Don't you want to learn React? <laughs> Does anyone? But yeah, I don't, I don't know generators. I don't know. I like knowing literally in memory where everything is. To me, that's kind of mandatory. Closures, I think, are the one area where I'm like kind of okay with it because I think closures are usually like not something you're going to use across a boundary where you want to know where things are in memory. I gave up on Rust async when it took me less time to rewrite the code. Rewrite the code, then debug why it would randomly hang. Yeah, that's tough. If you write an executor, you can know where everything is in memory. Yup.
Tokyo is just another framework. Yeah, I I feel like they promised so much more than than what we got. I don't know. It was looking good in the early days, and then maybe it's gotten better. I haven't used it in like a year, to be honest. But the last time I tried it for like a a proxy, I think like a midum proxy for a game, it sucked ass. <laughs> Plus, you get the cool state machine transform from async function. I just don't like it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like those constraints. I don't like that environment. I don't like having a relatively generic executor that you have to replace if you want to change semantics. I, I don't like it. Sorry. There's, there's many reasons I don't like async. It's not just the one or two... In reality, I'm just never going to do async, <laughs> ever. I'm always going to select. It's just, it's just better. Worst code patterns if you're trying to dev fast, but I, I'm never trying to dev fast. It's never, really never really a problem. So, OK. So this is something that I've been experimenting with for basically preventing something a reference from being used twice um, in Rust. And this is kind of strange. And I, the problem is I need to borrow like specific fields off of a structure and, and basically give them away. So I want like this is like a one-time use sort of token, but behind a mutable reference, which is really interesting, because normally something that you could only call once, right? And the reason is because of this AREF, right? If we change that AREF and we run this, this will, this will build, right? So what you're doing is you're saying that the lifetime of this reference that you're passing in has to live as long as... Um, as long as the covariant lives, right? So you can only actually call this once because you, you're, you're passing, you're creating, well, not creating this lifetime here, but you're, you're passing in that lifetime at that point and effectively you can't use it for the rest of the scope. Perf dev, but slow dev, that's the only way. Cloudflare used Tokyo for Pingora, a faster Nginx. Developed it because Nginx is getting too slow. Yeah, it's wild to me. Nginx used to be like the zoomy zoomy fast, but it's really not that great. I've only recently like read a decent handful of the code in Nginx, and everyone always used to talk about it like it's the pinnacle of like networking code, and it's really not good. <laughs> it's not how you would develop any high performance thing it, it's just a it's a product of its time <laughs> so okay there that's a different scale i don't know i feel like that's the scale that like everyone's in at this point i mean Ultimately, a web host that's willing to like optimize and develop their own web server probably could fit a hundred to a thousand x the load on their server. So they could literally they could get rid of like racks of gear and replace it with like singular servers for like a standard static web host kind of place. Like there's there's really nothing stopping you from extremely high performance networking stuff, which is something that I've been thinking about doing for a long time. That's not where the perf problems are. I mean, the 
Engine X is never the issue? You talking like PHP, whatever it's farming out to? I would imagine that Nginx is the issue for a static company like Cloudflare. Like Nginx is is definitely going to bottleneck. It's it's not gonna linearly scale to a 64 core server at all. I could write a reverse proxy in Perl and I would outperform the backend. Yeah, yeah, and. The, the thing is, like, what I'm saying is that for st most static stuff, I feel like that's going to, like, that and SSL. Ca they use Caddy. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what the problems are in that space. I mean, I definitely don't know what the problems are in that space. They're at everything from scratch. That's what I would imagine. There's like no reason that you really need anything cots when you're running at a scale like that, in my opinion. You don't really have any benefits. Full on rust, boys. Hell yeah. Okay, so basically, I want to like learn how lifetimes in Rust work, and this is this is one of the things that like okay, one of the things I don't really understand. And I think I do understand more that I think about it, but I've never really thought about um like, where the variance of a lifetime applies. Like, I always thought about lifetimes more as a variable, as you would, like, kind of pass them through. But in reality, I think they're always specifically associated with the thing that they're used from. So, like, basically, I think if I put a covariant lifetime structure... If I make a covariant lifetime... So, here we go. Here, here we have a covariant lifetime. Let's make a... Invariant lifetime in the the new way that I've learned to write invariant lifetimes. So we have a covariant lifetime and an invariant lifetime. And what I normally would think is that if I like pass the invariant lifetime into and like created a covariant with that lifetime, that it would stay invariant, but it doesn't. Right? And so that was that was, uh, I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. But I, let's, let's, let's write up what I'm talking about. Because it, it wasn't what my instinct was. And I think it's because I never really thought about it. But I think it's also because I was, I was just dumb. So first of all, let's make something that uh, uh, shows invariance first. And then we'll, yeah, how do we want to structure this? Basically, I want to make an invariant thing. So let's just do that. Let's make an invariant. Obviously, if we borrow mute that, that's going to not run because we have that a ref there. And so actually, what do I want to do? How do I want to express this? A mutes covariant A. And okay. Oh, yeah, that's actually an interesting case in the first place. But that's creating a new life. Yeah. So, this is. It is interesting what I think.
So, what do I want to express here? That creates a new covariant. That makes self borrowed for that amount of time. Okay, let's do... Hmm. I'm trying to think, like, what kind of, like, Lego blocks I want to, like, play around with references. And I think I want the different forms of variance. But... Um... I don't really need the borrow mute. So we can make a bunch of different things. And let's make a contravariant. I think that should be contravariant. And we're going to put them in order. So once we have all these. Okay. Let's double check that. Let's check our work. Actually, can we get the compiler to tell us? Um, it's, it's weird because like, I normally think of variants applying to the lifetimes themselves, but I don't know if it does. Like, I feel like it might be applied to the... only when the lifetime is associated with something that is? Ah, maybe not. Maybe not. Basically, I'm wondering if I can treat uh, um, lifetimes basically as variables, but I, I don't think you can. I don't think, I don't think that's how they work. And, and now, I'm, now I'm stuck in my head. Okay. Uh, Rust variance and subtyping. Let's first make sure we have what we have. But I want to just play around with these and get a good feel of them. So, oh, that's contravariant for T. Yep, make C invariance both co and contravariant, and it's contravariant on the first one. Lifetimes are just Venn diagrams. I feel like that's pretty accurate. Contra that. Can you link the site? Yeah, 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 one second. And there's two of these sites that are slightly different. There's the Nomicon one and the non Nomicon one. Um, and they have slightly different information. Contravariant over mixed, but I don't know if that's being contravariant over that lifetime there. Um, makes C invariance contravariant out front, and I actually want to make this even more explicit just so they're all using the same syntax, right? Just so you can kind of see. 
what what we're doing. I, I think that makes more sense because this is returning the A, this is taking in the A, this is both taking in and returning the A. So let's uh, let's play around with something where variance. is needed. So what we should do is, let's do covariance, because that's like the standard one. I'm going to close this other tab. Um, this should build, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just watch that. Ooh. Uh, God, I hope this builds. Come on. God, the stream quality looks really good, chat. Very few people are having issues. I think it'd be useful to show things where it would work. Yeah, yeah. Show which combinations would and wouldn't compile. Yeah. Come on. This is a whole new install. This is a fresh machine, so I've got nothing on here. Come on. Come on. Mold would solve this. Cargo watch. Okay, should be able to build this now. And I think it's dash dash clear. Longer than I let before. Is it clear? I don't know. Control W cap N. Dash dash clear. I was right in the first place. Okay. So I want to make. First of all, I want to make proofs that all of these are covariant, contravariant, and invariant. I really would like the compiler to yell at us, specifically. Um, so let's try that. Um, um, use. Let's have a self, which is guaranteed to have the lifetime A. And then we'll have a uh, other and covariance A. I'm going to probably confuse myself because for some reason I think about lifetime slightly differently when they're refs versus the actual like contains a ref. I saw this about lifetimes and traits. Oh, interesting. I don't know if I've seen it. Let me see what it is. Copenhagen Rust community. Who is this? Did I miss a lot? You haven't missed shit, dude. Okay, so... What this is going to do is it's going to require... Or, more specifically, it's going to require that... Uh... Ooh, wait. Yeah, this is going to require that those can those should be able to be different lifetimes, right? Let foo is equal to covariance phantom data. Let bar. Uh, well, this will be uh, covariant one and covariant two. And I should be able to use covariant two and covariant one. 
And I'm just passing that in right now. Oh, use, yeah, probably. Um, we'll call it befriend. And the lifetime shouldn't matter here at all. Okay, yeah. So, uh, and then we'll ref that. Yep. Okay, chat. So, uh, do you want a little quiz as to what, what do lifetimes look like for, if you were to write out all the lifetimes for this line of code, this function declaration, what would it look like? Specifically, what would you put here, and what would you put here? Because those are the only two lifetimes that aren't uh, specifically declared. So, Desu banned from answering. So, if you're not familiar, this is a, this is a good quiz. A and B. No. Not A and B. Oh, and uh, we could do like this, because we didn't specify that, right? Uh, Slef. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, never mind. It's implied because it's self fucking being dumb. But yeah, so what happens here is just thought it would use the impl a for self. Yeah, and I think that's a common thought, but that's not actually how it works. So there are a few different um, function declarations that you can effectively have. There is one like this. One like this. We'll just say foo for this. We'll just make examples. We'll get rid of the, the A's here. Yeah, we'll just say this is a U32. Fuck it. So the rules are actually really, really, really simple. So what it does is if there is one lifetime, it will generate a lifetime for it, and it will use that lifetime. If there are two lifetimes, each one will get a distinct lifetime. If there are, if there is a lifetime in and a lifetime out, it will use the same lifetime for both the input and the output. And this is a weird case where outputs will get the lifetime of the self parameter if there is one. And that would get B. And this wouldn't be A and B in this scope, right? It's not that A. It's a different A. It's a new A. That makes sense. Um, so that's really it. Basically, if there's for for each input, they get assigned a different lifetime that's newly created. Outputs get the lifetime of only if there's one lifetime or one reference passed in. Otherwise. They will get the life here. I'll just bring up the fucking rules. They're they're pretty simple. Uh, what does the a and imp a? It's the lifetime that's held in the structure. So in this case, this would become b, c, b, and c. Right. So that's like actually how this would look. Um. Where are the good docs on this? Is it the Nomicon? Uh, 
feel like... No. Oh, Lifetime Illusion. Yeah, here we go. And there's actually... I think another version that's not the Namacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one's a little easier to understand. But basically, in order to make common patterns more ergonomic, they can be elided in function item pointer and closure trait signatures. The following rules are used to infer lifetimes that are elided. It's an error to elide lifetime parameters that cannot be inferred. The placeholder lifetime underscore can be used to have its lifetime inferred in any way that is possible. For lifetimes and paths, using that is preferred, blah, blah, blah. So each elided lifetime in the parameters becomes a distinct lifetime parameter. So that basically means that it is going to allocate, it's going to add a lifetime parameter that you don't see under the hood, right? So it's going to, to sneak one of those in there. Then, if there is exactly one lifetime used in the parameters, alighted or not, in the parameters, that lifetime is assigned to all alighted outputs. So if you have one lifetime in all of the inputs combined, the output will be a, the output will get that lifetime for all of the outputs, right? And then there's one more special case, which is that if it's self or mute self, then the lifetime of that reference um, is for all the output parameters. It's it's quite simple. So here are all the examples. So you have like you have the stir, the lighted expanded version, and then you have the actual version that it will generate. And here, yep, there's just one input. It's going to create a unique parameter for the input, and there you go. So the special casing for self is only about outputs. And it basically means that it just will prefer the self lifetime for outputs. Otherwise, it's required to have... Um, only one lifetime to allied return lifetimes. So then here, same thing, two parameters, one doesn't have a lifetime, so it's just one lifetime there. Here you have a lifetime in and a lifetime out, so it will allocate one for the input, and then when it's computing what it's going to use for the output, there's only one possible option, so it picks that. Mute self, uh, that's going to be the same thing, one input, one output. Even though it's self, the rule doesn't actually have any effect here because there's just one lifetime anyways. It's the one I would pick. Here you got a self and args. This is going to have to allocate one for the, the self and then allocate one for this. And then for the output, it will use the one from self because that's the one to use. So you have A and B, completely distinct lifetimes self, and b. There's also an implied where a colon b. I don't think there is. a outlives b. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Um, then you have, yep, these. Here it's applying a lifetime to the, uh, the structured lifetime. And that is passing it through and out. Oh, this is the function one. Oh, I actually didn't even think about how function pointers looked. But yeah, ah, it makes them a distinct scope. So it does a 4A for that, which is cool. Um, Dyne, same thing. 4A is where it generates them, the unbounded lifetimes. Yep, can't infer a lifetime here, so you can't do that. You have to declare it yourself. And here, it doesn't know which one 
which lifetime to use from the input uh, from S or from T. So you have to distinctively tell it to do that. So yeah, basically, the rules are very simple. <laughs> like, if you have an output with a if you have an output with a lifetime, it gets the same lifetime as all the input parameters. If there's not a conclusive one lifetime for all inputs, then it gets uh, then it would pick self. If there is a self, and if there's not a self, then it's a, a compile error. Think about it. Uh, ref b foo a would be invalid if a does not live b. That's fair. That's fair. I don't know if that actually takes effect as a lifetime like that. And I'm actually kind of confused what happens in the ref self where self has an A. Well, I mean, I know what happens. I know it allocates a new one. But it's kind of... Oh, I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. All of the inputs have distinct values always. It's only the outputs that it affects. Yeah, okay, sweet. All right. So basically, let's let's write these out. B, C, B, and C. So that is actually what that is doing, right? So self still has the A. B is, you know, B. C, and then A we explicitly uh, said. In fact, we can just say, actually... We can say self here, right? OK, so this builds. And the only reason this builds is because the variance of these lifetimes allows the lifetimes to end up working out. So the problem in this case is we're basically creating a scope here. So let's say this is cove 1. Um. Uh, and then we'll make another scope, which is lifetime cove 2. OK. And then we have, come on, I don't want the fucking long ass intro. <laughs> OK. So basically, um, this works because these are covariants. And what this is doing is even though self in both of these cases, um, and let's just be really explicit, covariant A and covariant A, right? And then uh, cove one. Cove one. Okay. So this will compile because even though we're saying we want, we don't really care about the reference lifetime. So these references we're creating, we don't, we don't care what the lifetimes of those are. We only care about the reference of what's contained, the, the cove 1 and the cove 2. Now, cove 1 and cove 2, we're saying we want, the same, we want the same lifetime for both. We want them both to be lifetime A. But in reality, lifetime A can change with variance. Right? So in this case, these are not the same lifetime, right? Cove 2 has a Cove 2 lifetime. Cove 1 is a Cove 1 lifetime. They live for different times. So if you are expecting that, like, the only way this API could be used is that they're both, they have the same lifetime, that's not what this is saying. This is saying that they have to have compatible lifetimes. And it can do that by reducing the lifetime or 
they do have to have the same lifetime, but it can do that by reducing cove 1 to cove 2. So basically, the variance here is saying is, is it valid to decrease the scope of cove 1 to the scope of cove 2, right? And the compiler says, yes. Um, the uh, lifetimes, I don't know if it checks both, are covariants. I guess it would only be, uh, only cove 1 has to be covariant here, right? Yes, uh, I think. Let's double check that. The lifetimes are covariant. So this is what I want to do. Every time I question something like that, I want to write something to test it, right? That's how you learn, especially in these deep ass weeds. But in this case, this is what happens. Since these are covariants, Russ says that I can decrease the lifetime of cove one to cove two because cove one lifetime is strictly a superset of cove 2. And thus, there's no problem temporarily decreasing the lifetime such that you have cove 2 and cove 2. Well, technically, more specifically, it's reducing it on the, on the structure lifetimes. So that's not, that's not the best way to put it. It's more like cove 1, cove 2, and cove 2. So this is like effectively what will run here, right? Um, okay, perform call with parameters covariant cove two, covariant cove two, right? Right, so basically, Decrease the lifetime of the first parameter down to cove 2, which is a smaller scope, and it will build. And it does, right? But what happens if we do that same thing, but we do this for invariance? And let's just give it the same function. Um. Okay, but are these not, is this not invariant? Is that not invariant? Or am I being really dumb? <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm pretty sure that's invariant over the lifetime. Yeah. Okay. B friend B covariant B. Why is this? Building. Is it because they're not constrained? Do you have to do the closure syntax?
Because those lifetimes are invariant. What? That's not behaving as I want. Because the creation of it is not uh, fixed to a specific location. 4A is the only way to get an invariant lifetime. Yeah, this is... These are invariant lifetimes, but the lifetimes themselves can be created out of thin air. Right? So, this is just creating them with the same lifetime, I guess. Okay. What if you use cov1 after the block? That's fine. What if you make a function that explicitly accepts lifetimes? What do, uh, what do you mean? One that like produces like a like a new function? Oh, like if I make these different? I think if I make these different this won't compile. No, it does. Oh, because those can still be the same lifetime. Yeah, yeah, the thing is, it, you can still... The, the lifetime itself is invariant, but the creation of the lifetime is not constrained. Uh, what do you want? You want test of a... Now they're constrained. Um, yep, they already in scope. I mean, one of them's going to have to be uh, from the original scope. Yeah. Like, this should work, right? Oops. Oh, let's just pass them and fuck it. Right, this should compile. Right, yeah. Because they still have the same lifetime. Okay, so the the biggest thing is we need to create these with a an independent lifetime that can't be duplicated. And the only way I know to do that is with the uh, um, for syntax on closures. So we'll do uh, create. This will allow us, let's just call it scope. This is going to have an F uh, where F is a function that gets called once, and that function is going to receive uh, covariance 
Um, can I even do this here, or do I have to do it outside? I'm not sure. Whatever. Uh, uh four a. Let's try it. A. So we're gonna pass you a covariance. And then we'll do funk, and then we'll do covariance, phantom data. Right, so that's basically creating it. Yeah, you do need... All right, I guess I want befriend back. Yeah, and here, let's do this. Uh, contra co. And now we can be explicit about these lifetimes. I like this more. Okay. So, bam. All right, so this builds. Wait, we don't want to construct those. Um, let's do covariance. Just say new. Uh, cov one. Now it feels more scopy as well, which I kind of like this. Cove two, because these are actual scopes now. Okay, and now this code should build, and it does, right? Okay, there we go. I like this. I like this way more. Um, and then we'll do uh, macro rules define variance, and then we'll do. Uh, uh, ident. And then phantom. I guess that's a type. And then we'll do this. Okay. Ident. Ident. I didn't. I didn't. Covariance. Phantom. Yeah? Yeah? Can I introduce A's here? Uh, covariance was returning. Fuck yeah. Interesting. If I change this to a B, it'll say not declared. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> That's interesting. Fuck yeah. Let's go, baby. Contravariant. Invariant. <laughs> You're breaking macro hygiene?
I didn't even know you could break macro hygiene like that. But I am. And I fucking will. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we'll just mark that pub so it shuts the fuck up. We'll put those in some modules. That way we can't accidentally construct them. Right? Okay. Fuck it, we'll tab it in. You can't, you can't redefine, ah, oh, fuck it, then we just won't do that. I was going to do that to make it a little bit more separated out, but fuck me, I guess. Okay. So we have the phantom data that's held in there. That's the actual thing that's describing the... Lifetime, so we have covariance, which is returned, contravariance, which is input, and invariant, which is both contra and covariant, which makes a invariant. Can cat ident? Does cat can cat ident work yet? Oh yeah, yeah, I can just do this. Can I put this up top? Can I do that? This isn't C, right? You can do that. There we go. Invariance is never constructed. Pub, pub use. Go fuck yourself. Okay. And then these don't actually have to be used. Hey! Our code builds! Woo! Okay, now we don't have warnings, which is pretty good. <laughs> hey, Supermoon, how's it going? Java, when you walk down. Okay. Okay. Isn't that fucking nice? So now we can define three different lifetime generators, right? Okay, Desu, what were you asking? You were asking some dumb shit. If you swap Cove 1 and Cove 2 and befriend, it shouldn't work. Still works. <laughs> Which it should, right? It can reduce the lifetime to the smaller scope. So it's doing this. It's reducing the lifetime of both Cove 1 and Cove 2 down to Cove 2. So that... Next, we have invariant. Now, this will not build. This will not build because we're using the wrong function. Oh, there's some metric here? Wait. Yeah, it can still... Wait, oh, now I'm confusing myself. Like a Goomba.
Is it because of this? Ah, uh, that, 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 that. Okay, well, now I'm confused again. God fucking damn it. Item A, item B. Can that still make those the same lifetime? Because they can be the same one. But there have to be two new lifetimes created. Which is what you get. Is it changing it? Are these not invariant for some fucking reason? It's a mute. Like that? Yeah, yeah, it's definitely invariant. Oh, befriend is okay with them being different. Yeah. Thank you. Jesus. Yeah. Literally the opposite of what I wanted. Okay. And then the other stuff should build though, right? Yes. Okay, there we go. So there you can see that the variance fails here, and this is, we are expecting that the two inputs have the same lifetime. And in these, they don't have the same lifetime. We're creating two different lifetimes. But due to the variance of those lifetimes, they can be coerced into shorter lifetimes, right? So Cove 1 can be coerced into the shorter Cove 2 lifetime, and then it can call this, and basically it's, it's still passing in the, the two different things, but the lifetime is shortened, right? And the closure is only required because otherwise the compiler would just create them with the same scope, I guess? I don't know how it does that. I don't know how it was working when we were creating the lifetime ourselves. Because that's introducing a new unconstrained lifetime. Want to upload this to YouTube? I think it might be good enough that we'll probably upload it. Usually I upload them right after, if, if they're good. Let's see. Um... Okay, so I, I still am confused how making the invariant lifetimes myself, which I no longer can do because we put in a fucking module. Here, let's change that to this, right? This will build, yeah. And this will build because it can give the same scope to these. Is that, is that what's happening? It just, it just, instantiates the same scope at the start. 
Doing category theory? Yeah, we're doing some weird shit. Covariant and contravariant functor stuff, basically. We're trying to express a uh, safe parallel is initialization using the language itself. And right now we're kind of just learning the, the deep properties of uh, variants and lifetimes and stuff. So we're just kind of going through and we're making little experiments. And any time that something doesn't work exactly the way that we expect it to, we're, we're clarifying why or why not it works that way. So like right now, we don't really know why this works. And the only way this could possibly work when they're invariant, because it requires that they're the same lifetime, the only way that's possible is if they have the same lifetime in the first place, right? And I don't really understand how lifetimes get created in that sense then. Because they... Covariance will force these to be the exact same lifetime. Or invariance. Covariance will allow them to just be two compatible lifetimes that are a subset of each other, right? If there's overlap in the Venn diagram. <laughs> um, so let's see what, where are lifetimes created? What does the Nomicon say? Doesn't let you explicitly name them. Um. Yep. References that outlive reference. Be sugars to that. Yup. The area covered by a lifetime. Here we go. This is this is the good shit. Hopefully. <laughs> a reference, sometimes called a borrow, is alive from the place it is created to its last use. The borrowed value needs to outlive only borrows that are alive. This looks simple, but there are a few su subtleties. The following snippet compiles because after printing X, it is no longer needed, so it doesn't matter if it's dangling or aliased. Even, the, the, even though the variable X technically exists at the very end of the scope. Yeah. However, if it has a destructor, the destructor is run at the end of the scope, and running the destructor is considered a use, obviously the last one, so this will not compile. Yep. One way is to convince this uh, is to drop it. And a lifetime can have a pause in it. You might look at it as two distinct bars being tied to the same variable. Yep, where you can have that. Historically, Rust kept the bar alive till the end of the scope. Yep, but now with non-lexical lifetimes, right? That's what allows you to do this. But I don't know like where, where they're created. Um, NLL, oh my god, yeah, it's so important. Unbounded. I think the right way is to think about this more as like sets. I think. Um. Yeah, because an unbounded lifetime. Because lifetimes can be sets, right? 
That's basically what this is. Unbounded is like, this can be anything. So it's like, you can use this where it is this. Are lifetimes effectively unbounded? I, I think maybe I think about lifetimes wrong. Um, for all choices of A. An infinite list of trait bounds F must satisfy. For all choices A. An infinite list of trait bounds. Um. Hmm. So I imagine that there are basically no trait bounds originally. Can we use lean and cock to prove correctness of Rust code? It's it's weird because I think a lifetimes is the other way. I think of lifetimes as like this is creating a set where it has to be one lifetime, one specific lifetime, and otherwise it can be a list of any lifetime. But I I guess I guess this has an infinite list of trait bounds on the lifetime. Uh, I gotta think about that. Be right back. I'm gonna get another Swedish fish. Hmm. Because I, I want to think about them as, like, sets or something. Because clearly they can get assigned or reassigned in, in weird ways that I, I don't expect. Okay. Swedish fish. Oh, fuck yeah. Wait, the Swedish fish are so fucking good. Okay. I think that's what that group's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rust belt. Okay. So yeah, how should I think about lifetimes here? Because I kind of thought that it would create a new lifetime for like every variable, but clearly it can use... Hmm. Because it can just have these be the same scope. 
Cove 1 and Cove 2 just have the same scope, I didn't think that was possible. Like, I didn't think you could have two different variables with the same scope. But I guess you can. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't know what this means. An infinite list of trait bounds. The way I read it is, like, it creates a lifetime. Of a specific lifetime. Whereas elsewhere in Rust, you get like a, a whatever lifetime. What a poor way to phrase that. It's trying to say that F is generic over A. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, F can take any A. Right. For all choices of A. And I guess F itself, in this case, is the scope of the closure, specifically. Because for all choices, A, and it adds the constraint on, on F, which is itself. The A lifetime is contravariant. Well, it's more than that, right? Because normal normal contravariance isn't enough to to make like it's because it, invariance still allows that to compile, right? So, like, I I always thought about it as being contravariance, but I think it's way more than that. Contravariant with respect to F, yes, which is what prevents me from moving it out of the scope, right? I can't do let mute fleen is none and say that cov2 uh, fleen is cov2, right? That won't compile. Well, it will in this case because I, I have this still broken intentionally. Um... This. Right? And it's to prevent you from moving stuff out of the scope, right? And that's like, that's kind of the whole point of like why this concept exists in the first place. So yeah, I think I think the the broken one is an interesting example. So like what is happening here? Cool Chinese blog about it? Oh, interesting. Holy shit, dude. That image is so fucking true. That image is so true. Like, that's why I... And, like, that's why I talk about it. I hate procedural macros. I hate macro rules. Like, I'm trying to do it at, this way, if I can. This guy's a big fucking turbo nerd. I can tell you that much. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so what happens here, it, it creates Cov 1 and Cov 2 with the same lifetime? More specifically, it allows it to grow? So I, I think Cove 2's lifetime is expanding to Cove 1's. Is that what's happening? Like, what is, what is the set of lifetimes that Cove 1 and Cove 2 are? Why can I do that assignment when the lifetime is in variance? I think it's because that a and nu is unbound so then so they can be combined um The invariance will force that they have to be the exact same lifetime. And the only way that these could have the exact same lifetime is Cov2 lives for Cov1. So, okay. So the way that I view it, and I think the way I view it is correct in terms of behavior, but not correct in terms of like how it's mathematically modeled. But the way that I view it is that basically the 4a syntax is creating a new specific lifetime. That basically the set of lifetimes that it can be is, is one lifetime. Whereas otherwise, this invariant new function can take the lifetime past in that's that's exactly what it is that's exactly what it is it, it's that the new is taking in a lifetime and the lifetime that it's taking in is the lifetime of cov one so it is the same scope right nice stream hell yeah thanks for stopping by yeah, that's, I think that's the right way to think about it, is like, this way, when you call new, you're passing in the lifetime that it's going to give you, and the lifetime that you're passing in, like, sometimes I think about this as like the, the lifetime of the scope of the function, but instead it's more like a variable? I don't know, I like... I don't know if that's the right way to think about it. That might be a, a bad way to think about it. But like, but yeah, you can pass in a lifetime and it will be like, yeah, I can give you one of those. So what you're doing is you're basically f forbidding the user from passing in their own lifetime. And you're creating a new lifetime that is effectively in your control rather than in the user's control. And it guarantees that it's new. For each instance of this, it's a different lifetime, right? So like, this, this way, new can take the same lifetime in multiple invocations because you're passing in the lifetime. This way, I'm giving you the lifetime and every time you call this, I'm going to produce exactly one more lifetime, right? But I don't know if it's the right way to think about that lifetime as getting passed in. Because that lifetime itself doesn't have variance associated with it, does it? Is that a bug? Late to the stream, will it be archived? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll upload it to YouTube 
after I edit it, by edit it, I mean find where we start doing things and truncate it to that, or uh, forward truncate it. <laughs> Unless this is a bug. But I feel like that's not a bug because, I mean, okay, I think the hard part is how you think about the association of the, I, I think the tricky part is like, is this A invariant? And I think the answer is no. It is invariant here. And I f feel like variants basically I, I don't know. Like the way I would want to think about this is like, yeah, this is going to force that A is an invariant lifetime, and invariant lifetimes can't be shrunk or grown, but they can start off with the same lifetime. So I don't think this is an I don't think this is a, a bug or an issue. I feel like this just makes sense, right? Because you're passing in the lifetime you want it to use when it gives you this thing, and the lifetime that you're you're given is the one that you passed in, and you can just give it a different you can give it a lifetime. Now I guess a lifetime is more about the end of a scope rather than the start and end of a scope. It's invariant with respect to some invariant A and usages derived from it, but otherwise it's unbound. Yeah. So does that mean if I make if I make an invariant thing and then I use that same lifetime to make a covariant thing? Do I get covariance behaviors at that point? And I think the answer is yes, which is cursed. Okay, so this invariant stuff doesn't build, of course, because it requires that these have the same lifetime and we generate a different lifetime each time, right? Yeah, and I think a big thing is I need to stop thinking about lifetimes as a start and end, and more specifically as the end. Because I think about like, oh, cov one and cov two, even in the in the broken case without the four A, well, they have different scopes because one of them has to exist before the other can exist. But that doesn't matter because they can both end at the same time, even though that's even tricky to say because one of them technically has to drop first. But like language wise, unless it just is the whole scope? I don't know. I, I don't know. Because arguably you could instantiate both Cov1 and Cov2 at the same time, even though the computer has to instantiate them at different times programmatically, like theory-wise, they could be instantiated atomically at the same time, if that makes sense. That's probably more likely what it is, where it is a strict start and end scope and the invariance requires that the scopes are exactly the same scopes, specifically this same instance of a scope. This is why I think about lifetimes as Venn diagrams. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess the, the, the thing is, the way that they describe it is like this has the infinite constraints, but I feel like I want to think about it as the opposite where this is creating like a single a single one point in space otherwise by default it is the the full set the the whatever the fucking math term is for all values right like these lifetimes could be any possible size of lifetime or whatever but this is like, no, it's got to be this one that is corresponding to this scope.
Which, if you think about it as a tag, yeah, is just one, one single point. Okay, so I want to try creating an invariant lifetime, then making like a, I don't know, like a, a like a pass through sort of thing, and I think. So this is going to do the pass through. Bam. And then what I'm going to do is pass. Uh, we'll have to impl this outside of the, eh, fuck it. to covariance. And then we'll take in a self uh, ident A. So we're specifically taking in an A, and then we can just produce a covariance A. And then we'll do uh, covariant val.0. I want to do val.0 specifically. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. What? Covariant. Mm, oh, is it incorrect number of functions? Oh, because of this, yeah, because it is a different phantom data. Okay, we'll just do that, which is going to create a, which will just pass it through. And then, yeah, A does have to be passed in. Yeah, type of phantom data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted to make it like really, really explicit, but whatever. Okay, so then what I should be able to do is let's cov one is invariant to covariance cov one. Um, yeah, but that's just. Now I don't want an explicit befriend. I want, uh, I really only care about the lifetimes at this point. Um, let's actually just try this. I think this will do what I want it to do. Uh, cuff two, cuff two, covariant befriend those. Yeah, and that compiles. So, yeah, basically the, the lifetime is just a scope. The variance is contextual, right? Because, like, this, this made an invariant A. It made two created two new, out of thin air, fully constrained A lifetime. It made two different lifetimes. It then, just, it then used that same lifetime to make a covariant. Um, but yeah, the lifetime is really only describing the... It's only describing when it is used, the variance. It's not defining it across that boundary, right? Like, the lifetime itself doesn't have a variance, if that makes sense. So, this will be an invariant comparison because I don't, well, when it's invariant, because. A is forced to be invariant in that case, right? 
And okay, I think that clears up a lot in my head. So basically, variable declarations and stuff can be rescoped to a larger scope such that they can be originally created. So if you want to constrain the scope, you need to create one in a closure, um, which makes sense. And then variance applies only the variance comes from the context, not from the lifetime, I think is the best way to think about that. That it doesn't matter that A at some point was invariant. It's no longer invariant in the case of a covariant comparison between two things, even though the lifetimes were distinctly uh, invariant lifetimes originally. But I shouldn't be able to move that out. Yeah, in, um, and if I converted them back into invariant, then yeah, it'd be, it'd be the same. Basically, these are, these are two distinct scopes And the covariance comparison allows me to shrink the outside scope to the inside scope because, yeah, yeah, I think that makes sense. That's way simpler than I, I thought. I don't know why I, I don't know. I kind of thought that, like, it was more like a taint thing where, like, once a lifetime got tainted, then it was, it becomes, like, permanently... Uh, invariant, but that doesn't make sense because that requires like infinite recursion of functions to basically figure out what that chain is. So yeah, that that makes no sense from a a compiler design perspective. That being said, I want to have something like that in my language. I think where lifetimes are more like a variable, like a compile time variable, effectively. Okay, nice. So I think that clears up everything with li lifetimes for me, then. Um, yeah, we haven't played with contravariance, but I, I think contravariance just never really applies. <laughs> Because contravariance is already kind of uh, happening due to this scope. I could be wrong. Maybe there's some tricky, tricky things with contravariance. Um, let's try it. Let, let's see what contravariance looks like. The only contravariance is that. Yeah. I mean, this is a contravariant lifetime, right? But it can't have an effect, <laughs> right? Because the lifetime could just be unbounded. Or, or, or not. <laughs> Depending on if you think about it as the full set or the empty set. <laughs> See you around, Holo. A spooky lifetime, yeah. Yeah, I think it's that, like, contravariance just can't ever really apply without creating a new lifetime. Because this allows you to shrink lifetimes down. This allows you to expand your lifetime this doesn't allow you to shrink or expand it right is that correct that allows you to shrink the lifetime this allows you to use a, a larger yeah this allows you to use a, a smaller lifetime this allows you to use a larger lifetime 
But yeah, I think contravariance just never is going to come up. For what I'm doing? Am I wrong? Is that one of the things that someone suggested? Um, I don't think so. Bam. Yep, just anything non-covariant. Okay, so now let's think about... Um, now let's think about how this works in the realm of... Oh, let's get rid of this shit. Okay. So yeah, I think contravariance is just never really going to apply. But we'll keep it around for, for, good, for good measure. Taste it. Now, I made an example of something earlier up on stream, and that is effectively something of this shape. Um... Uh, fn do something let's take self right so if i make this foo and let's make that mute so obviously i can call do something on this multiple times in rust because uh yeah that doesn't have to even be that so I can call do something multiple times because, first of all, you can alias references, and second of all, it's, it's the same, it's not being borrowed anymore. If I make this mutable, then I can still do this. And I think this is only since non-lexical lifetimes. I think non-lexical is required for this to exist. But we can disable non-lexical by forcing a specific... Uh, okay, so... Okay, if we were to do A, that's what it's already doing. So this will work. So what I need to do is make that lifetime... Uh, really anything other than covariant. Contravariant and invariant are both okay here. Because what I want to do is I want to prevent do something from being called twice with a reference, right? That is something that I could see myself wanting to enforce at compile time with the type system of this can only be called once, right? And the way that we have to do this is we have to associate a lifetime with foo because we want to prevent something on an instance of foo from happening twice. And the way we were going to do this is just put an invariant lifetime in it. Okay. And now we have an invariant lifetime. Um, and what's really cool here... Uh is that, oops. Um, let's just do this. We should be able to do this without a closure. Uh, okay. So we should be able to do foo invariant default. Okay, so this will build because these lifetimes that come in are not A, right? So this builds, but if we change this to A, this will not build. Yeah, because it's already borrowed. And uh, let's just say default here. Beautiful. And then here we can say if we're covariance, oop. 
Does that work with covariance? Really? I'm surprised that that works with covariance. Right? Let's just double check. Yeah, that's definitely covariance. That's okay. So th this is great. I don't understand this. And we can get rid of these covariance things. We don't give a shit. So how is this possible? How? Or is this just the compiler not being smart enough? Where in theory this could compile? Because I feel like how what is this Rust lifetime wizardry? Ah, that's what we're trying to do. <laughs> we're trying to do naughty stuff. Um. Huh. Why is that? Let's do B. Obviously that works. B outlives A. B where A outlives B. Okay. How does that work? <laughs> oh, we got to make this B, I guess. Yeah, okay, okay. There we go, that's why. So... Yeah, wait, wait, what the fuck lifetime is this making? That's making a third lifetime. How is it not complaining that the lifetime's never used? If I do this, this doesn't build, right? Oh, you can, oh, you can just declare lifetimes? Okay, I see. Okay. Woo! All right, so we can figure out how, which property is being enforced. And it is... It, it's B over A. So this is what it's desugaring to. Or the effect it's having. And yeah, this is saying that the B is greater than or equal to A in size, which unfortunately is the opposite of, of how Russ says it. Russ says, Russ says like, it's a, uh, uh, wh whatever. I'm going to say that this says that B is a larger scope or equal to A. And yeah, the first time you call do something, The first time you call it, so yeah, I guess that constraint is auto-applied. I think that's what Desu was saying earlier, is that that lifetime is, is implied, which makes sense. Okay. Why can't you call this twice then? Would Clippy tell you? I'm not sure. If, would Clippy uh, tell you that the lifetime is unused? I'm not sure. So... Okay. 
Okay. So here, here's, here's how I'm going to describe it. I'm going to say that A is all. Right? It's a set. Then we say, hey, we need a B. That's bigger than A. That's equal to A. And then that's going to be We need a B that's greater than or equal to A. Which is only A. Right? Only a valid lifetime is A. Right? Uh, borrow for A. Thus, A is literally just A. And then borrow for A, which will remove A from the set, right? Of usable lifetimes. Because it's, because it's in use. Because it's like popping the only fucking valid lifetime? Is that, is that, is that a really weird, stupid way to think about it? But, the, yeah, the way I think about that is B has to be greater than or equal to A. But the only thing that can, has that property is A itself, because it's equal. And you use that here, because you borrow for that here. And I guess non-lexical doesn't work here? Why does non-lexical lifetimes apply here? Because I'm not returning it? B outlives A. Uh, yeah, and this shouldn't compile, right? A outlives B. No, that does. If we made this invariance, this wouldn't build anymore? No, it still does. Okay. So, it, the variance is not what matters here. Well, arguably, this is an invariant. That is invariance. Or, this is covariant, sorry. This is just a standard lifetime, so that's just covariant. So B is covariance, and A is invariance, and let's go to this, and this should build, right? Yeah. Okay, this is what I'm confused about building, is like, oh, but I've got an invariant thing. Well, the thing is, that doesn't make both sides of the comparison invariance, I think. So, B is covariant because this is just a covariant lifetime. It's covariant. Um, but A is invariant. Right? And if we do this, it won't build. But if we go this way, it will. And you would think that this neither direction would build. And the reason that this builds is because the B is allowed to adjust its size. A cannot. A has to be a specific thing. 
but B can adjust itself into becoming A. And then this is saying A outlives so this, right? That's the comparison that happens here. B is covariance, A is invariance. I'm a bit weirded out over your use of variance. Yeah, I, I, I know I think about this in a, in a weird way. Because a thing can be variance over something. Vec t is covariance over t. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so in this case, um, <laughs> the, the lifetime is... I'm talking about the lifetime with respect to, I, I guess, itself. I'm only thinking about the, the variance of the lifetime itself. Because lifetimes themselves have variance. With respect to other lifetimes, right? <laughs> like... Yeah. Like variance, variance in or whatever. But yeah, it's, it's covariance in B, right? So it's covariance in B, and it is invariance in A, right? All, all of the variance we're talking about is specifically about the variance for the lifetime. I, I don't know. I, I, I know I, I talk about it in a, in a weird way. It's just I've never formally learned this shit. If we wanted this to give us our lifetime back, then A should be fine. Yeah, already in scope. I just don't quite understand why non-lexical lifetimes don't take effect here. Because it creates a new reference. Because there's only one of these. Ah, what the fuck? The point is, if you can subtype a thing, you have variance. Covariant. A is a subtype of covariant B if A outlives B. A is a subtype of B. Yeah. But I don't know. Oh, you're trying to get something to reject? I. I don't know. I like the way I think about it more.
This one is strange, though. I, I don't quite understand this one. I don't understand why non-lexical lifetimes doesn't allow this. Like, why does this not build? Hmm. 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 Why does this not make sense? Because they have to be the same scope as the original? Because it's on self itself? I feel like this doesn't line up with what I was seeing in Rust chat. Because they were saying it had to be non-covariance. Which was this example. God damn it. Why do I use foo for all my fucking names? And this example specifically said it had to be non covariance. And I'm really confused why. Because I think I agree with it. Oops. God fucking damn it. <laughs> uh... Yep, and that won't build. Oops, got to make that mute. Bam. Okay, and then... But why? If it's covariant, it still builds. Is that just a limitation of the language? Because foo is already borrowed for A, but A has... After the first call, but A has already been shrunk down. Yeah, like, that's what I'm thinking when I'm thinking about, like, this removal of the set. Which I, I know makes, like, no fucking sense. But, like, yeah, we're back to the covariant one. Right? And in this case, every, every fucking lifetime is covariant. Everything is covariant here. But the reason I know what you mean, but maybe I don't know lifetimes either. I don't know. That's who save us. I, I can't figure out if Desu is confused or he's trying to communicate something to me that uh, I'm not thinking of correctly. But I, I feel like explicitly. I was told by Yand, <laughs> Yanders, <laughs> that this has to be, for this to work this way, this has to be non covariance. And I think it might just be a limitation of the compiler. And that's it. I wanted to say hi. I am Ophis GF. It's me who made the cheesecake. Well, it looked fucking amazing.
It looked delicious. I've I've never dared try make a cheesecake. I'm I it looks hard. <laughs> it looks really hard and I'm terrified to try. I feel like baking is so much fucking harder than cooking. <laughs> Every time I make cookies, I'm off by like one pico ounce. Does this fail? Still fail with B self instead of B mute self? No, it won't because it. I mean, there's many reasons why though. <laughs> because it's just it can be aliased. That's the tricky part. Is the mute has to be in there. It's actually really easy, I promise. Maybe I should try it out. <laughs> that's what, okay, that's one of the parts that's really fucking hard here in this specific case because the, um, <laughs> the fucking mute, it, it's, we're doing really weird things, right? Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think about this in, like, a completely different m way. The way I'm... The way that this makes sense to me right now, not building, is that... Um, and, and this should build, right? Yeah. Yeah, this builds. Uh Wait. <laughs> but how does this work? <laughs> I guess yeah, that's fine. Foo can contain a reference that lives longer than this. But that's not the default. And then this works as invariant because it doesn't matter because, because B is not invariant. If B was invariant, can we... Uh, can we constrain B? I've never tried this. Um, why does Rust D sugar to B over A? Is this build? Yeah, that builds. That builds because it's a completely new lifetime. This builds because B is just a smaller selection. B is the reference that's created here during desugaring. Yeah! That's what it is. I feel like that's what you'd almost expect from Rust. But the thing is, it's borrowing uh, B here. So it's making a, a foo. It's, it's doing that, right? In one scope. And then it, it does it down here and it, it, again, right? So that's effectively what it's doing. It's creating a, a lifetime on those. But when we do this, <sighs> let's, uh, I want to get rid of self just so we're like really strictly defining everything here, okay? And then we'll do foo. Do something foo. Okay, here we go. 
So if you don't have the where clause, this builds. If you make these all the same, it doesn't build. It does. Whoa. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, OK. And that means that that has the same behavior as B, where B outlives A, right? So that's like what it desugars to, effectively. So, I think effectively, and this works with covariance as well, which is really fucking weird. Is this... Oh, I mean, I guess this makes A invariance. Yeah, that's what it is. A is invariant here. That's why. Yeah, I think that's what Desu's probably been trying to describe. So the reason that this doesn't build, even though that this is a covariant thing, is that, yeah, B is covariant, but A is invariant. Even though A is part of this, which is covariant, A under a mutable reference is invariant. Right? And if we think about it, the, um, oh, it all makes sense now. Okay, yeah, um, because the B, right, so when we look at this, what we're passing in, just think of all, no, it's, it's definitely invariant. It's, yeah, it, it's 100% invariant, that's what it is. In fact, I think that might be what they use in scope. Here, Desu. Desu, you want to look like a bitch? You want me to prove you wrong? That is exactly the form they use to create invariance on scope. Now, it's slightly different because we have two different lifetimes, but it's the same thing. Scope becomes invariant here. This, this is covariant. This is invariant. Because, in this case, B is covariant, because B is the, the first thing, right? So B is covariant because that is the, the reference. Then we have the mute, then we have the T. In our case, the T is a foo A. The A is part of the T. And thus everything in here, right? This is covariant, everything inside of here, this entire T. Basically, you could replace this with a T. which means that A becomes invariant. The entire expression is invariant. Yes, yes. Because if anything is invariant, then all of it is, right?
Yeah, so that makes sense. So I think that's just an error by Yanders. He was probably just not thinking about the fact that the mutable self implies that the, f the foo reference, right? Because basically I was asking about this, and he's like, here's, here's a pattern. You take foo, you, you get one, right? Unconstr you just make one. And then here, you have a foo, and then you have a foo mute self. But the thing is, since that is self, and self has foo inside, it's all invariant. So this doesn't have to be non-covariant at all, right? It just do it doesn't matter, because it's already non-covariant in this context. Now, in other contexts, it, that would be a different story, right? So it, it is important if these were... Right? You get it? I think Desu gets it too. I think he, the way I think about it just triggers him because it, it probably makes no sense to the way he thinks about it. But I think, I think we're all on the same page. <laughs> I just think about it in a dumb way. <laughs> But yeah, A is invariant. I, I am, like, the way I think about these is as types, right? I think about these as types and values. So I think about this as, like, B is a, a type, which is a scope. So we have, like, scope B, and then we've got scope A. And then what we do is scopes have comparison functions. It, it's it's kind of like signed and unsigned. So let's say that B in this case, in this case, B is absolutely uh, covariant. And when I, when I say that B is covariant, I think about that more from like a compiler design perspective, where like you are going to propagate like bottom up or something, and B starts off as covariant. Now, once the comparison operation occurs, then B becomes invariant because it's being compared with A, which is invariant. And th but the way I think about this is more like types, where let's say covariant is like is signed and variance is unsigned, and it's like integer promotion shit. So we've got like covariant B, we've got invariant A, which is in invariant because it's forced to be inside of this environment. And then we do uh, if B is outlives A, Right? And this will effectively cause the like C casting because the, the order precedence is like basically invariance. Um, everything gets cast to invariance, right? First. Because one of, one of the sides was. It's like an integer promotion rule, right? This is how I think about it in my head. This isn't... I, I would argue this is how you would have to implement it. I agree that th th it's invariant at the end of the day, but, like, it started off covariant. Like, A here is covariant. At the structural level, it is understood to be covariant. At the impl level, it's understood to be covariant. It's only in this case where it is invariant. Right? I don't... I, the thing that I don't really understand in my head is this, like, ordering and precedence. Is it... 
covariance goes towards contravariance, which goes towards invariance? I don't think so. I think... Okay, basically, what are the different comparisons? Well, I guess what... Yeah, what do things... That's not how it works? Is it not? How else can you implement that in code? Because it's not math. I'm not talking about math. Like set theory shit. I'm talking about like how actually do you implement this in a compiler? And I feel like you have to implement it like that. Where it's like, it's covariant, this is covariant, it's covariant, it becomes invariant here. Because you can't do your comparisons until you resolve your types. I guess, yeah, I guess it's not cast... Yeah. These... I understand what you're saying, Desu. Um... The, the, the thing is, I'm treating invariance as... In reality, they're just like fucking range syntaxes, right? Where covariance range syntax is this, and invariance is that, and contravariance is, is this. And then your comparison that you're doing Right, like, like that's, that, that's, when it comes to arguments and subtyping, those don't exist. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. To me, it's way easier to think about what the compiler would do than the, like, theoretically what it would do. It's, it's the same way that, like, I struggle with, like, biology and shit. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah. Like... Basically, I just think it's range syntax. <laughs> I, I think that's probably how it's implemented. And that basically the, the range here is a... Uh, I'm saying like... Yeah, if that's covariant, where it's like B and smaller. Or uh, actually I want, I think, this syntax. Like B and larger or more specifically, greater than or equal to. I think, I think it's more like that, where this is contravariance and invariance is equality, right? That's, that's how I think about it from like a, a compiler perspective. So like, it, it depends on whether, like I'm thinking about them I, I don't know, I think about them in like multiple different contexts, and I, it's hard to vocalize when I'm changing how I'm thinking about it, because there's like, you can think about like the expression you're accumulating or the inverse expression. And one is like what the lifetime represents, and one is like the constraints that get you, there, whatever. So covariance, I think I would most likely codify as like covariance means that the lifetime 
the scope provided must be greater than or equal to B. Contravi uh, and this is like if you're providing like A outlives B. For A to outlive B has to do... Uh, I mean, it, it's weird because I'm thinking about variance as applying some of those rules. But I think it does. Where it's like, this is more like saying this. Uh, can you remove mute on do something? This. And try to borrow few mutably after two blocks. Like that? Oh, and then borrow it again. I can just bind it. Uh, that? Yeah. So, yeah, the way that I view it from a compiler perspective, or from how I think about things, and at this level, it's important to, like, I Yeah, this should be fine. I mean So when you define a lifetime you basically have to fulfill whatever requirements are of that lifetime. And I guess by default here, B, um, B outlives A is default for self, but it's not here. Because that's just a completely different lifetime. Type theory is hard, yeah. So do something val a Yep, and that's covariant. And I think if this is invariant, it will still build. Yes. Okay. And that's not what I would have expected before. Yeah, because before I would have thought that this would, like... Yeah, because it's already invariant. Here. So it, it literally doesn't matter. Because um, that's invariant. That's, that's how I'm thinking about it, because I, I genuinely think it makes the most sense. Is that A is invariant... Like, ultimately, what I care about is what the lifetime... So... Do they talk about this? Basically, the direction things go. Um... But yeah, I think I think invariance is basically tracked on the lifetime up the stack and covariance has to only become invariance and contravariance only can become invariance. You can't go from covariant to contravariant. I don't think that ever exists. Um, invariant, bam, 
And then this, this builds. This builds because, yeah, because bees never, yeah, this is invariance. This is not invariance, which means that this can pick a non-invariance lifetime. So it does. It just picks a, a much less constrained lifetime. But if we combine them, uh, where B outlives A, oops, shit. Now it doesn't work because I think this gets forced to invariance. I think I am correct in how I think about it. I think ultimately invariance drags everything towards it. So if there's, and basically it, it built before, no problem. Because B is still in, B gets passed up and it is asked contractually to the caller, I, I, need, I need some covariant lifetime. And when you constrain it down, this way, you are saying that B has to outlive A, which there's only one, which is the very first one, right? Like, it can, it can still pick any lifetime as long as that lifetime outlives A. But A is invariant, and since A is invariant, it's a specific lifetime. And there's only one lifetime that outlives a specific lifetime. And that is the one specific lifetime. Which means that once you use it, it's gone. Does that make sense? <laughs> like, that's how I think about this. Whether or not that's how it makes sense to other people, I don't know. But I still think it's a, a completely valid and it's more about I'm describing how the compiler would implement it rather than how the math would express it. And I think what you're seeing is you're seeing someone with no math experience do type theory shit. So I think about it as the program and other people will probably think about it more as like the sets and the math. <laughs> But to me, that's how it works. It's like, in, invariance, or more specifically, this is making an expression where invariance comes into the picture. So let's say like this is how we express these things. So co covariance is like, give me a lifetime that lives for greater than or equal to B. So a good example would be, you can give me static. Static is fine. And that's what you're doing here. You're saying, give me a fucking lifetime, right? You're asking that of the caller. And here you're saying, give me a lifetime that lives for greater than or equal to B. Contravariance is, give me a lifetime that lives for less than or equal to B. So it's subbed out, which is that, that scope sort of semantic. And invariance is... Give me a lifetime that's equal to this scope. And all lifetimes are, like, all scopes are, uh, yeah. So then here you're basically saying, in this model, give me a lifetime, call it B, that lives for g equal to a, right? b must outlive a, 
So b is greater than or equal to a. So our expression so far is b is greater than or equal to a. But if we think about these in terms of typing, we have an invariant a, and we have a covariant b. Now, the way that I view that is that these will just both turn into invariants. And then you perform the comparison, right? And that's just going to lead to only one equality. In reality, it's like a set. So you're saying covariance is a range of Bs. So this is things that are equal. And these, this is saying things that are equal. Or this is the set of things equal to A. And this is the set of things that is greater than or equal to B. And then you're really just saying, give me something that, uh, give me the overlap between these two sets. So give me the fucking union, right? And what's the, what's the union? What's the and between these two things? It's A, which is just one. There's one lifetime, and it's A. And then that means you intersection. Sorry. Yeah, you're right. I guess, yeah, it's not a... It's an ampersand. Intersection is... What do they use? The XOR operator or whatever? You got what I'm saying. If these were bitmaps... If these were bitmaps defining the scopes, in fact, that's probably very close to what the actual view is, is that these are bitmaps. <laughs> and so it's like covariance is like, you can be, you're like sine extended up, right? Contravariance is zero extension. And invariance is uh wait, what's it what's it what's the what's the better way to put it? Yeah. Like yeah, I, I think I think this the range syntax I think is totally fine, right? So covariant, and then let's just say this is static, right? That's like more what the uh, right. This is probably how it's expressed in the language. There's no fucking way. There's a more efficient way of expressing this, and it's basically a here starts off as that can be static to a, which means that this can be static to a, right? Right, if we're thinking about that as a range, it's like that's static to A, that's static to A, this is static to A, this is static to A, which means that this is static to A, but it's not because it's invariant. So it's actually A, and that's a range, so it's A to A. And, and we'll say equal. There you go. There you go. Yup, and that being behind immutable reference. And this B, this could be anything. This could be anything from static to B. This could be anything from static to B. And this could be anything from A to A. At some point, these two walks meet. Siran <laughs> Dasu. That's how I think about it. And that's probably how it is. It's like you, you have these constraints that are coming together <laughs> from two different sides. And at some point, they collide. <laughs> right? You can just keep propagating from one to the other. 
Right? Is that not how that works? Like, you start a walk here, you start a walk here, you apply variant, you walk both directions. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. It, like, I don't know, I think that way might allow you to... Hmm. Would be nice if they... If instead that Russ made a close constraint about what is covariant and variant contravariant, they added the ranged lifetimes to their implementations. I do like this ranged lifetime thing. Because it's, it's kind of true, static is kind of up here. I feel like this logic just works. And you just walk them together. Or I guess you walk them... Until where? Where? I guess once they collide, you just and them, right? That's all you do. So it doesn't really matter where you end up walking. When you go up, you can fan out. It's not a linear path. It, it is... Um, in reality, I mean you're walking down from A until you reach the end of A's uses. And that is your path. Yeah, you're walking, you're walking down it. So yeah, it doesn't really matter walking up or down. I think about it as like walking up because, because they're just anded together. Just everything's fucking anded together. I feel like that's the best way to put it, is literally everything is anded together. <laughs> right? So like, yep, that's that set, that's that set. Here it becomes invariant, so it's anded with basically just being itself, which will cause this to have to be only A. I think about it as the set of lifetimes you can union together at any given point. Intersect. Yeah. 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 Yep. That. Yeah. And in this case, there's only one. And it's A. And once you use that A, it's gone from the set. Right? Because invariance means that there is only one exact match. So you can't borrow it twice. Mutably. The mutability is what's making this invariance. If it's mutable, then it's gone. Yeah. And yeah, so static in that range is in that range. Static is like lives in a global forever, like it's a const. Well, not const, but it's a static, right? Static is like the longest possible living lifetime because it lives forever. And A is whatever you specify, right? And yeah, covariance is static down to and including B. Does that make sense? I'm going to get rid of that. And then, yeah, you just intersect all of them and you get the result. And in this case, a became invariant. I love how lifetimes are fucking red in this specific um, syntax highlighting. It's perfect for this stream. Bam. 
am. Okay, so this won't build. And that is because this causes the intersection to bridge across the two lifetimes, right? Without that, there's no bridge. And thus, there's no intersection. And thus, B is not constrained to a single lifetime. Because this, in basically, once something becomes invariant, it's, it's fixed at one one possible lifetime. And so in this case, that bridge never crosses. So this can still be a specific lifetime. This is just a lifetime that, uh, that lives shorter. A outlives B. Um, which doesn't even matter. Like, it just doesn't matter to have that, right? Basically, A outlives B performs that intersection. New highlight color. Yeah, we picked a highlight at the start of the stream. I wish Russ let you declare global variables, global lifetimes that are static but invariant with one another. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I think that makes a lot more sense now. This, I like this diagram. This is how I think. <laughs> this, this is so much more clear to me. And the action occurs probably at this, at the where. Yeah, because they, because they each have their own paths. So you would walk from A back to its origin, and you'd walk from B down to its origin. And if any of them have invariants, they become invariant, which means they have to be a specific thing. And they're just basically sets behind them. But it's the colon that, that does the enforcement. And when you do A mute on itself, A is... That bridge is crossed... I guess it kind of loops, so maybe I shouldn't think about it like that. Like, all these are just connected together. But now, A, if you do this, um, this builds, right? This is like how you would normally write Rust. It's like, I need a mutable reference to a foo A. When I do this, A is now invariant. Because A has to be compared with this A, or more specifically, this A is invariant, which means that this A is also invariant, means we, which means there is literally only one um, lifetime that satisfies this call. And so you can't just keep creating new lifetimes, there's only one, which means that you can only call do something once. Right? Does that make sense? Did we get there, chat? How fucking cool was that? So let's, let's try and build some weird things with this. This is how I'm going to think about lifetimes from this point on. I, I think it's just correct. And, and everything's just, I don't know why I have semis. I guess I was writing C. Uh, brackets. Yeah. Okay. So cool, didn't get it. I think it, I, I tilted Desu to death. Desu, I think, has math knowledge. So the way I talk about these things and, and ruin all these phrases that mean stuff is probably really cringe. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So, Tay, you want to walk through some examples? 
How does, how does that sound? I'm going to piss, then we can walk through some examples. Doesn't that sound really fun? I think I also got to change my mic battery. Might have to change both, both these batteries. Okay. <laughs> As not a math person, I like the way you think. All right, be right back. I'm going to... Oh, yep, be right back. I'm going to piss and change these batteries out quick. Doop, doop, doop.
Epic should be back. Yeah. All right. New batteries in. The other day, our project manager asked our devs, why don't we upload code directly? When they complained about the deployment issues they had. I mean, why not? Just, sh just ship it, dude. Coding looks good. Stream quality looks healthy. Batteries for the microphone. I have a wireless mic. Okay. So let's try some examples, chat. Okay. <laughs> Everybody has a testing environment. Some are lucky enough to also have a production environment. <laughs> That's pretty fucking good. Dude, that's so cool. I think we're right. I went out skating the day of the stream. Hell yeah. What'd you skate, man? God, that's so fucking cool, man. Bam. And then that's just the same. Bam. Let's fucking go. Inline skates? Morocco streets? Oh, fuck yeah, dude. You got like a whole crew of people I got? I got some inlines sitting around still. I was I was pretty big into them as a kid, but my parents never bought me some, so I had to borrow. I literally skated in skates that were like four or five sizes too large. There was some kid in the neighborhood who was like six years older who let me use his skates or just gave me his skates or I stole them. I don't fucking know. But I would like skate around in those. That was, that was pretty sick. I, I like those inline skates. I was never good at them. I should visit Morocco. Morocco sounds fun. Isn't that where I go to like launder money or something? Morocco. Solo, most skaters are thieves in Morocco. Cause you know, Africa. God damn. To be honest, I would say like sk skaters and skateboarders, definitely not always the most honest people. <laughs> I can see why a lot of places have like no skating, no skateboarding signs. The 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 type of people are a type of people. It, it, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now that we made our graph. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm the only honest person. Well, that's exactly what it what a dishonest person would say. 
So, X to fucking doubt, bruv. Okay, so now, in our befriending thing, we require that two things have the same lifetime. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do our example. Yeah, let's do our fucking example. We can get rid of Foo. Foo's gone. Oh, wait, no, we want that. We want this. I want to pin that up on my wall. That's how I'm going to think about lifetimes for the rest of my fucking life. Actually, I'm just going to put underscores here. Bam! Okay, 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 okay. Invariant, uh, new invar1, invar2, invariant befriend, invar1, invar2. Yep, cannot build. What do we have here? Wait, what? Oh, that's the whole log. <laughs> uh, how do... Okay. Yeah, the Vim terminal clear screen is kind of weird. Um, okay. Invar2 escapes the closure, yep. Yep, that, because they're invariants. Borrowed data escapes the data of the closure. Invar1 is only there. Invar1 escapes it. Argument requires that one. Okay, what's one? One must outlive static. Invariant one. Yep, so this is invariant one. Okay, so let's think about this. Invariant one. This is some concrete lifetime in var one. <laughs> And this is a concrete lifetime, or let's, let's go to the bottom. Invar1 is the lifetime on the phantom, uh, or on the, Invar1 is the lifetime on the ident, which is the phantom data, which forces it to be invariant. So when we come up through here, we have an invariant, which is a specific lifetime, a specific lifetime, specific lifetime, and then this constrains it to only things uh, less than static. Because if things get to the static lifetime, then things can just like be static. <laughs> so, let's see. Phantom data, so here, by our syntax, we basically say that that's hard-coded. We say that this is A and below, which means that that has to be just one A. Yeah. Yeah. If we pass in the A up here, this is saying, um, it's still invariant, but, but it's, um, it can't both be static. So, from this end, 
Oh, from this end, it can just pass in. Yeah. Yeah, because up here... Basically, when lifetimes are created here... Or in the four, which we're not using right now, they're created contravariants. But when they're created here, they're created covariants. Which means that, like, you have static down to everything. Which means that these can just be... They can both be A. And I think the lifetime just ends up being A on both of them, which is why this works. Yeah. A. Basically... Isn't one covariant to two? So, the biggest thing is that the... When lifetimes are created by default, they're created... Uh... Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I guess uh, new lifetime is equal to static dot dot. Contravariance and that for clause is where you can cap it. And hmm, I'm trying to think about like how how that affects these ranges. In this case, A isn't one lifetime; it's a set of lifetimes that are valid for both invocations of new. Yeah, yeah. Invar one. So the um FN once as an input. Yeah. Contravariance must be capped by second lifetime. Yeah, like... Basically, I think contravariance... Like, I, th I think this, this rule set is valid. Like, creating a new lifetime is this. This is creating a new contravariant lifetime. Now, the thing is, like, oh, why couldn't it pick the same lifetime? And I, I think it is ramifications around this because this is a reference and fn once is a reference right like that's referring to your scope and thus even though in theory with contravariance you could in theory just have the same scope for both you can't because you need to use covariance to access the contravariance. Am I wrong? Like, I'm thinking by these rules. I'm trying to find, like, the bare-bones rules. And I think a new lifetime is static down to anything. Covariant is static down to a thing you pick. Contravariant is a thing you pick down to nothing, and invariant is a specific thing. And in this case, 
it can pick the same lifetime I like I feel like that's actually correct F isn't a reference But F is a reference. I don't necessarily know, like, how it, they de-sugar it, but, like, that's borrowing uh, an environment, right? Because it's a closure. Yeah, function pointers are references. Yeah. Yeah, like, I think these rules, and you basically walk both paths, right? Whenever you have two lifetimes come together, you walk both paths, and you apply these rules. Lifetime start static dot dot and you basically go from there anding it together <laughs> all the way up and I think that works because like the the reason I thought this theory could be wrong is that the Okay, so let's look at the, the fucked example. This one, where it does build. This is invariant, right? Our, our invariant thing, that's invariant. So A is invariant, which we are requesting an invariant lifetime. So we're... But... We're requesting that specific lifetime from the set of all lifetimes, basically, right? So we're basically saying, I just need any specific lifetime that exists. And this can produce that. This can produce static dot dot in, in this syntax, right? So it can create that static dot dot. This can be static dot dot. I know that's not actual syntax. And these can both pick the same thing because they can both pick the same A and they can use that as the A for these, right? And now that passes this, even though these are invariant. Like, these are invariant, which means this comparison is invariant, which means that these have to be exactly the same lifetimes. And they are. But the reason I think, the weird way that I think this generic expression works, because if you, if you think about it the other way, now let's look at covariance, where I was saying you start with, like, a lifetime down to something, and you start with a lifetime down to something. Um... Now, this one didn't build. Now, you'd be thinking, why can't we do the same thing here, where we have A and A, right? A and A. But you can't. Because, even though if this was just purely raw contravariance, I'm pretty sure you could, at least according to this logic. But, but, that is impossible because the fn once itself is a reference which means that you have to have a new scope because you're passing something in that lives for a different duration which forces this to be at least a minus one right 
basically you can't you can't pass in a reference like here you're declaring a new thing with like out where it outlives a right but you can't make that promise here because this scope is smaller because this scope ends inside this one and you're giving out a reference so to be able to give out a reference you have to basically change the scope right like anytime you create a reference you have to change the scope so you can create a bunch of things with the same lifetime if you're like not creating a new lifetime between them or a new scope right i i don't i i i mm. I get what you're saying. The function call implicitly generates a new lifetime, and those two calls can't produce the same lifetime because they're nested. Yeah. Right? So, like, I think if fn once somehow wasn't a reference, in which case it would be impossible to access invar2, right? Right? If you think about, like, what a closure d sugars to, you can't pass in like this scope doesn't have access to variables outside the scope except for by reference can you change that with move yes and that makes sense. That makes sense. With this theory, that's it. Just this. New lifetimes make this. New contravariant lifetimes make this. Right? Oh, I guess we're already in the, the version that works. Fuck. OK, this probably won't build. JK lol. Um. Yep, these still are different scopes. Yeah, I think that's just honestly a special case. No, no, it's I don't think it I don't think it is. I think I think this theory applies. I think contravariance you can get two of the same lifetime created. However, you can't because you're creating a new scope inside of something, right? So, contravariance inside of contravariance, by nature, has to be scope minus one, if that makes sense. That's how I'm viewing it is like nested contravariance requires at least a decrease of one unit of the scope. And I think that is purely explained by the, the argument that gets passed in. So I think this really simple model expresses lifetimes, which honestly is probably how lifetimes are expressed internally. Because this is like a very powerful tool because it allows like the entire language basically to be structured around this. But it's very cheap to express because you don't have to accumulate and solve mathematical formulas, right? Instead, you just have these like ranges that get constrained.
But yeah, I think... Lifetime... Um... Invariant new, invar two... Yeah. Yeah. Because this... This funk has some lifetime on it. This FN one somewhere has a lifetime. Now that could be handled like internally in the language such that it doesn't actually exist. But it also very much could. Actually, that was great. Um, args is tuple. Yep. It's basically the tuple of all the things you pass in. So in this case, it's going to be a ref. Um, I guess, yeah, that's going to be a, a ref to the ident. I'm curious if we get a different error here. Yeah, invert to only exists inside the closure. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to say if they like special case this thing, but I don't think they have to. So interestingly, I bet I can put, hmm. Will this be uploaded right away? I'll, I'll try. <laughs> I'm getting tired. It's hard to care once I'm really exhausted, but I'll try. I'll give it the college try. I do have to re-encode it, because I have to re-encode it up to 4K for YouTube, so it's lossless. Bah! Um. Invariant. I think in reality, it's just creating a new scope whenever you do this. Like, the contravariance is strictly, this is originating a new range from A dot dot, and every time you call this, you get a new range. And then it has to, you know, find the, the matching set, which is, is probably more likely. It probably walks all the way up the stack. If it's contravariant, it's, it's less. But for something to be less in a scope that has references already, it has to be less than. I, yeah, I think this is, I think this is ex expressive of, of what happens. OK. So that means, can we make a situation where we can only borrow each field of a structure once? So here's what I want to enforce at compile time. Struct moose. Moose is going to have, uh, I don't know. Chat, give me some field names. Uh, moose is equal to moose. Cake and horns, okay. Perfect. Oh, we just needed two. Cake, five, horns, five. Okay. All right, here's what I want to do. How do I make something 
that only lets me borrow them once each. So I want to do like moose cake. And we have to do mutable. Mutable is giving us um on that this lifetime itself okay ah uh, yep so we're covariant both of these lifetimes are covariant basically i want this to fail to compile without wrappers in here that's where it's hard it's easy otherwise but without changing the shape of moose specifically i want to be able to borrow cake horns print cake and horns And then this failed to compile. Right? Okay. Can we do that? <laughs> I, l I like the Unicone structure. <laughs> Okay, um, so right now this, this compiles, which I don't like. All right, what weapons do we have to bring to the battle? Um, moose. I'm okay with you. Uh, we're gonna get an allocator. This allocator is going to allow you to make things that you specify the type of. I'm going to give you them. Uh, I'm going to give you them with some of my own schlem going on. Impel Alec. Gonna upload to YouTube? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that. So. We need to. The mute reference. That is a covariant lifetime. We have to force a contravariant lifetime into these borrows. Okay. Uh. Wrapped holds T's. This is uh maybe on an it T. Come on. Okay, got a T. We're going to give you 
We have to give you contravariance around moose. And to get contravariance at moose, we have to give you moose through a closure. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, where f is a function that's invoked once that gets a wrapped t and then we can associate a lifetime with it. Take it away, make it away, cry. We're going to call it uninit. Is it going to track if the value is initialized? Uh, phantom data. This needs to be invariant. Fuck it. We have that. Invariant. On an it. Okay. Uh, we don't necessarily need to go to the on init state right away. Yeah, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have borrowed. We're gonna try and track at compile time the borrowness. Oh, fuck, dude. How do you do that on multiple fields, though? I feel like you need a lifetime per field. So there we create our contravariance. We can call func wrapped. Val. State. Uh, we're just going to do this. Phantom data, fn, ref, out, ref. I wish Rust syntax highlighting and Vim highlighted the matching uh, carrots. It's really annoying. Okay, so that now has a very specific lifetime of borrowed. Make my way through the crowd. Ah, but the bit the bit the bit the Uh, this? I think I need a lifetime per field. I don't think there is a way around that. There we go. Or marker phantom data. Yeah, don't give a fuck. Okay. So now we can do a uh, wrapped new moose cake five horns five. Okay.
Okay. Let's start with this. Okay, moose. We cannot implement DREF. We have to make our own DREF. So we can brand it with lifetimes. Set match pairs plus equals colon that. Jesus fucking Christ. Jesus Christ. Oh. oh, God, that's so good. Thank you so much. Holy dick. I, I, I knew that was possible. I've just never bothered. I didn't think it'd be that easy, to be honest. Okay. Mm, some, like, access type beat? Oh, fuck. Uh, mute self. Right? That's gonna be invariant. Butthole. Um. So. Oops. This is the moose. We shouldn't be able to access the moose. Uh, uh. Right? Wrapped, new, not found, moose. It's just new, I just called it new. The best quality is raw, but it might have problems in your browser because it's got a weird encoding. But VLC and MPV can stream it. Uh, it. It'll be by far the best quality if you stream it directly using the link at here. Okay, and mute news. Nice. Value doesn't live long enough. This should work for one, though. Oh, fuck me. Um. <laughs> oh! It... What? But it doesn't have a drop handler. This builds, right? Yeah. Okay, this is cool. If I do this, this will obviously build. Yeah. Okay. Borrowed mute self. Borrowed. <sighs> That's weird. Actually, this doesn't have to be wrapped. 
No, it does. It does. Um... Need a semi after the funk? It doesn't matter. It's no difference. Um, I prefer without in this case, weirdly. Uh, Moose declared here. Borrowed. Interesting. Okay, so let's try a map. And we're going to give access via the borrowed reference. What the fuck am I typing? Where F is FN wants of um be, 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 borrowed T. Borrowed mute T. Funk. Mute self val. Uh. Okay, um. Yeah, 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 that won't work. Um, borrowed. Does sometimes? Oh, interesting. I don't know that. Does not outlive that. 40. I think that makes sense. Um, borrowed wrapped. And I think. This is where I need to enforce T's references all become borrowed references. If I do this, Self thou Yeah. Um this is a tricky case. Uh because we moved it all the way through. We need a lifetime. This needs to be an allocator for this to actually work the way I want it to.
Which is totally fine. I think it's time to just switch to the actual code then. I do want this. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, cargo Miri test. Woo! All right, let's get that Sisroot building. I'm going to preheat the oven. Be right back. We're going to start getting ready to make some din din. I'm getting hungry. I'm getting real hungry. Do -do. Oh, chat, do I get more Swedish fish? Thoughts? Am I out? I might be out of Swedish fish. Okay. Do we got our cis root nice and built? We ready to do some mirroring? Doesn't live for long enough. No, it does not, but. Okay, let's change up the playlist. Okay, all right. Um, 460. Uh, first of all, we need to make these lifetimes invariant. This had placeholders, which were not invariant.
Um, on in it in whoop and uh, on in it out. Son of a bitch. Okay, on and it in and on and it out. Okay, that shouldn't affect anything. Um, now, uh, on and it scope. Let's just get this building uh, right quick. On a net. Be do you. Mm, has type that right. Oh, it's uh right. Oops. It's not right, it's receipt this. Okay, so this will build Ah, oh, god fucking damn it. Where else did I have that shit? Um. Let's see. On a net. Da da. Oh, we got an emotes download? Oh, let's see what we got. Okay. So we got all the classics. Oh, these are the high resolution ones. Oh, God. God fucking damn it, Windows. God fucking damn it, Windows. Okay, I uh, probably should extract the emotes first. There we go. Uh, static pings. View content. Uh, Ah, uh, Vim one. Okay, those look good. What are the WebP ones? Will those work? These look pretty good. I uh, just I just double checked that you're not giving me any any uh sketchy sketchy ones. Let's see. Let's see what ones I can do. Ping JPEG and GIFs. It doesn't look like WebPs are supported. I have to manually 
click on each one. Hmm, Kappa, Keck W, Lol W, Madge, Monka Hmm, Monka S, Monka W, Omega Lol, Pepe Hands, Peepo G. Okay, and then animated. Why does it not like cat jam? Do I already have a cat jam? I think so. Weird. It. Oh, some of these don't parse. Some do. I have no idea why. Uh. Okay, that should be all of them that the website took. I have no idea why. Why no more Twitch streams? Because it's more fun. It's cozy. Okay, on an it scope, let me make sure all these are working first. 4LT... Yup, 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 yup. Create a new uninitialized scope. We brand another person's structure. We define how long the reference to the queue lasts. Dun, bum, bum, bum. Dun, 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 Du, du, du. Oh, fuck yeah, hacker mans. Okay, uh, why is this not building? T of constrained on an it. Wow, a stream? What the fuck's that supposed to mean? Okay. What the fuck am I doing? Receipt on an it. Yup, lives for A. Yup. And it later. Lives for on an it. I want to go and slurp it up. Required that the storage lives for that. If I don't push to the queue, this should build. No? Fuck. What? I think this is in some weird state. God fucking damn it. This is just whatever state the this was in when I sent it to Desu. 
Uh, store. Oh! It's because I'm writing the wrong file. Jesus fucking Christ. I was like, bro! Like, how, how does that not fucking build? Because that was the thing that needed to change. Source, lib.rs. Okay. Bam. Okay, so this compiles, runs, passes Miri and everything, which is fucking fantastic. But it fails Miri if we push the field again because it's going to write to it twice. And that's bad, right? That's a race condition. So, we want to prevent that race condition. And I want to do that at. I really want to do it at compile time, but it requires that, ah, oh, Jesus. How would that even look? We need like two layers of closures because we need to brand this reference with a reference that they can't expand. So anytime they access a field, it has to go through a closure, like map. So we'd map and then... <laughs> See you around, Kiao. <laughs> it's definitely a little dank here. <laughs> I need to only allow each field to be borrowed once. To do that, I have to put the whole thing behind. I won't be able to use DREF. Because DREF doesn't give you control of lifetimes. Oh, self. Yeah, like, I can't. I can't create a lifetime here, right? I can? Really? Can I make this return this? I mean, that's what it should be doing by default. Can I make this return a uh, static? No. Yeah, so that, you can't change the signature on that. That's fine. Well, that's actually not the DRF we're using, is it? I'm going to comment that out, because we're not using it, so we don't get fucking confused, because that's not the DRF we're using. Oh, it is down here. Okay. I mean, that DRF is fine. Um... Okay. It's this DREF. Let's get rid of that. Okay, 462. So, basically, we give you a scope to allocate uninitialized fields. You jam those into your structure. You then give us your structure, and then you get your structure back. And that happens with write. So storage is a receipt on a knit. And 
a receipt on init is created up here. And that receipt has Uh, that's supposed to be A, not that it matters. Um. Okay, so. Yeah. Microphone crawled up my face. God damn it. Okay, yeah, sorry, I was probably really quiet for that last while. I guess it, like, snagged on my glasses or something and I didn't notice it. <laughs> um. Um, A on an it. So that needs to be invariant. And I, ah, it doesn't have to be. T of, okay, so we have a receipt on an it. A is the lifetime of the heap that we came from. Okay, and that makes sense, so that's A, and that's A, and then when we write to it, the A passes through, but it could potentially change shape. Okay, Oops. 462, so let's do, let foo is stored.map x move this in. Because that is now... Oh, I don't know if I can destructure and not lose that. Let's comment all this shit out. Do, 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 do. Ba, 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 da, boo. Okay. Mute. So let's implement some sort of map routine on this. Fn map self. Let's consume it. And where f is mute. Once a mute T unsafe self pointer as pointer mute star. Oh, and then funk. So that should give us access to this. We should be able to access the normal field. But we should not be able to access the uninit field. This should be a compile failure. Oh yeah, that's still on init later. So yeah. Um Oh, and we can't deref it because it needs to be static. Yep, argument requires that Q is borrowed for static, which it's not. 
but I don't think this necessarily is behaving the way I want it to. So... Yeah, because these lifetimes are... I mean, these don't have to be invariant here. So we can access those two fields. And the type here is A. We have an A ref. And then I need to be able to effectively discard a mutable reference. And I have to do this by, I think, providing myself with something that lets me access fields. So we'll say like accessor dot access has to be a closure. Oh, uh, yeah, because this is a, a covariant lifetime right now. The A. Um... Which means that I have to... Oh god, chat. <laughs> it's rough. Um... Normally E32. I need to be given an invariant lifetime. A new invariant life, arguably a new invariant lifetime for every uninit field. I think I don't think there's a way around that. I I don't I don't know how I could get around that. Right? How could I consume a mute A? I, just, I don't think that's possible. Um... Hmm. Hmm. What have we learned? We need to um, uh, apply a lifetime. I mean, it's just covariant without a container, right? Like what? Like... Hmm. Can I do it at like a tuple level? Can I make this like destructure? And do like a uh, mute x normal u32 mute x on an it u32.
like that type beat, and then this yields an R, and then you give me an R, and then this. Like, that'll build. That only allows us to access it once. But now I have actual references. I mean, that doesn't change anything. Unless this can brand it. Uh, there's really not even a point of a closure here, to be honest. Because um, we're not introducing a lifetime. I, I don't know if it's possible because I need to have I, I need to have covariant mutable references to things. I don't know how I force a normal access to be invariant. Unless the thing itself is wrapped. In which case maybe I can't do this for the normal field. And I have to have another... I think if these had their own lifetimes... Always? Let's try it. I'm gonna put my food in the oven quick. Bear back. Oh! We're gonna we're gonna try this and then I'm probably just gonna stop the stream so I can eat because I'm a hungry boy. Okay. Okay. Uh. So everyone having a good day so far? I do hope this is expressible. But I don't I don't know if it is, chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey Siri, set a timer for ten minutes. Ten minutes, counting down. All right. All right. Need to get people to from Dark Arts to watch the stream. I think there are so few people interested in this shit. Um. Okay. 
So let's say, what if we have the user wrap a field? So I don't think it's possible if we don't wrap a field. If they do wrap a field, if they give a lifetime to each one, I'm, I'm confident I can just make that work. Which arguably is probably just fine. Like, I, I just wanted to avoid it because it's kind of like gross. But maybe it's not as bad as I thought, to be honest. Like, maybe I just introduce a lifetime for each. Anyways, let's try this. Let's just, let's assume that we can have them wrap their shit. Which is fine. Um, 472, okay. Can we do it without having them each declare their own lifetime? That is the hard question, I think. Because I feel like we can only access them in it later, call it with itself. Ah, no, that should work. No, we should be able to borrow it as long as it's wrapped. Let's try it. Let's try it. We should be able to do the thing, chat. And now, we should be able to deref again. So unfortunately, we deleted that code, but uh, deref for st standard ops deref for receipt mute. Uh, fn deref self yields self target. Okay, this is the mutable mute mute type target T. Uh, deref mute. Okay, oops, 298. That has to be mute. Okay, now we're going to have uninit1 and uninit2. Two. two different fields. Uh, uninit1 and uninit2. Okay, this is DRF stored. So now you have a mutable reference. So we should not be able to DRF this. Stored uninit one U32. So that's uninitialized. Yep. Oh, sorry, X. Yep, we can't DRF that, which makes sense. Uh, because the typing is still uninit, and uninit on init later, that is absolutely invariant. So invariant, which means that init later, that is invariant, that's invariant. Okay, if both of those are invariant, so what do we do? We create our task, we create these, which is creating, oh, it's making them from there. So we're creating invariant lifetimes from the uninit scope. And that's coming from uninit. So we go for uninit, we make a new uninit scope, ref A, which is how long self lives. And on init here, so we are plumbing that through on init scope. This is how we actually allocate 
on an it. Yep, that's an inv invariant lifetime, which means that it is preserved. Self requires that on an it is invariant. This requires an it later requires that it stays invariant. So we're keeping the invariance and we're upping the ref count, making uninit data and passing that through. Which means that there's only one possible lifetime for those. I feel like I can just do it right off the uninits. So obviously I can't borrow that, but what I can do is make a receipt. And the receipt takes a reference to an uninit init later. And it returns a receipt uninit. And that erases the uninit lifetime, and that's fine because the uninit is now handled by the receipt. Okay. We effectively want to move the init later into here. So we need to make sure that init later cannot be borrowed again, which is the uh, on init on both sides syntax that we were working on before. So let's see. Let's do this. Let's uninit access that field. First of all, let's make sure this works. So let's do both uninit1 and uninit2. Both of those will just fire off to set uninit events, which will write 69s. And A and B are both 69. Perfect. And there's no race conditions or any bugs there. So obviously, if we duplicate this, now we'll have a race condition because we are allocating that out twice. So what we need to do is prevent that. And the way that we prevent that is by taking in our own lifetime that is invariant there. Okay, now I don't think we can push onto the queue at all. But we should be able to not push onto the queue. Oh, really? I guess due to drop. Um, 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 um. On an one U thirty two. So that still has the uninit lifetime on this. This is just some new fucking lifetime, which actually has to be the uninit lifetime because we force it. Um, okay. So that makes that invariant. I think that might need to just be covariant or countervariant. Receipt on the net. Hey, Urzuzo. 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 <laughs> oh, gotta add my food to the oven. <sighs> ba -ba -ba. Hey Siri, set a timer for 15 minutes. E Z clap. Uh. 
Okay. Let's see. Receipt. Stored. So how is that true? How is that? Um... Stored does not live long enough. Stored, bereft, ah, yes. Yes. Okay. Ah, fuck, I didn't mean to do that. Ah. <sighs> Um, terminal. All right, fuck that. Test, no capture. Okay, so the reason that this is failing is we are, we are basically consuming that lifetime. Yeah, I, I think every field needs its own invariant lifetime. I think that's the only way that I can at compile time make that work. Which I think is just bad. Like, I think it's just I mean, yeah, it would be at compile time, but the API would be so fucking ass. Because, yeah, I'm just not going to be able to borrow those. Ah, son of a bitch. Because that... Like, can I have it... Um... Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Because I feel like every time you use an invariant lifetime, you have to consume it. I have to have contravariance to prevent reaching into the static lifetime. Can I do contravariance specifically? Pog and Vim? No, this is just this is just Vim. Normal Vim. Ah, uh, receipt. If I did contravariant, I would be relying on giving a smaller, but then unique. Hmm. And to get contravariance, perf I, I think you need a marker per field. I don't think it's possible to have one marker 
that tracks multiple fields. I just don't think it's possible. Unfortunately. I, I don't know any way that I could think of getting around that, to be honest. Which sucks. Like... But yeah, I, I don't think that's possible. Which means that I just have to probably do it at runtime. Which feels bad, man. Feels real bad, man. How do I do it at runtime? What's the furthest I can go back? This? Beautiful. We need to make this not build. Currently it builds. This will be a raised condition. Perfect. That's invariant. That's invariant, and that's invariant. Okay, so those are a specific lifetime related to the scopes that they're in. That is writing, and what I need to do is on the init later. I think on the init later. Here. But I don't think this can be mutable. I don't think I can just have that do this. Okay, let's try it. Let's fucking try it. I know this won't work though. Once false assert not I all at once. I all at once is true. This is a race condition. Yeah. And I guess I have to synchronize here. This has to be an atomic. At that point, that can just be a ref. There's no reason for it to be a mute ref. Why, why does that not work with a mute ref? Because... Because I give it out? Because I'm writing at 328, which is on receipt mute. Self pointer. As pointer, write the value. How's that erase condition here? Because the receipt can't exist until a value is set, right? If I do this, I can't run it at all, right? Yeah. Is it lifetimes? Explicitly A on that. Uh, macros degenerate wrapper types and transmute them back. Yeah, once you do that, it's easy, right? 
Once once you're willing to use a macro, then none of this is a problem. Because you can just implement all of this in macros trivially. So it's not really that... It, it's not that it's hard to make this work. It's hard to make it work using the type system. Cert not aisle once. How do you get multiple init laters? Um. Because I have exclusive access of this data at this point. And then I'm only going to give access to the value. So I feel like this should be fine. Why is it not? Um. Thread. Atomic. And that I L. Oh, it's is it because it's uh just because I'm getting mutable access. I'm not actually accessing it. But the act of obtaining mutable access is the problem. Because this contains T, and I'll be so if I get rid of this, it's not on here. It's on IL. It's on the borrow. That's the problem. Here, it's going to be elsewhere. There, it's an actual race condition. Oh, that's getting immutable access to the value. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's because this contains T inside of it. Even though it's behind and uh, uh, maybe on in it. So I just need to put that behind an unsafe cell. <laughs> right? Right? And maybe on and it on the outside. So now we do this. Now we're fucking cooking. It's weird. It's weird to be protecting an unsafe cell with a non atomic, but it should work. And that's clean. And then I'm happy with this. It's really weird. But this is one of the very, very few cases. We basically, basically, we still have a mutable reference to T, but this is, this has already theoretically queued this up in another thread to like handle processing of this field, right? And when that happens, it feels pretty fucking bad. So let's do that. Unsafe cell where for eighteen. This uh unsafe cell raw get. Oh, I mean that's not necessary. Um get that. I mean, I have the ref. Uh, no, that was working. Okay. I thought. Okay, my food's ready. Looks like shit. It's fine. Come back to it. 
Uh, fucker. There we go. 393. This. Dot as pointer. Um. Uh. Unsafe cell. Raw get. Okay. Uh. Shit. Uh, il dot val dot as pointer raw get that and then this is as maybe uninit t which is now mute that fuck yeah still raise condition Fuck. All right, chat. Well, I got to eat. I got to go. It was a fun stream. I'll see you all around. See you some other time. Bye-bye.